Okay, so um, I'm going to try to put a, I, I'm supposed to catch you guys up to what we're doing with this um, update to the MTP because um, this is a plan that we have to update every four years and we're currently about halfway through the process and so here we are with a kickoff meeting for a grant um, that is supposed to be helping us make an improvement there. So we're going to cover um, quite a bit of ground on that. But to set the stage for that, um, this MTP update is really more of a refinement type of update. So this is something we do every four years, and after we adopted our blueprint vision for the region, we did an MTP update that was kind of the first principles setting update. So we had done this big study, and we um, held a really um, robust outreach program for the update of that MTP, and we came up with a vision that was like the first step in implementing our blueprint. And so what this MTP update is, is the next step in that. So we're really kind of narrowing down on, this is the vision that we set for ourselves, so let's keep moving forward and trying to implement it. So I want you to kind of keep that in mind as I go through um, what we've been covered so far, covering so far with, um, with the MTP. And in particular, what I'm going to be focusing on for you is what we covered in the public workshop series that we held in October um, this last fall. We developed three scenarios. Um, you can call those land use and transportation scenarios or sustainable community or sustainable communities um, scenarios, however you want to call them, but they are the, the assumptions of what is um, the growth pattern likely to occur over the next 25 years and what's the transportation system that would best serve that growth pattern over the next 25 years. And we modeled all of that and created a number of performance metrics. Um, to demonstrate how those three different scenarios performed, and we took those around the region to um, each of our six counties. We held nine workshops, and we asked for uh, participants to consider those scenarios, consider um, you know what goes into them, um, the land use and the transportation side, what comes out of them as far as performance, and then to tell us both as a group when they're discussing this, and then individually um, which scenario they prefer for both their county and for the region. And we've since then taken that information, compiled it, synthesized it, looked at it, and presented the recommendation to our board of directors of how we should proceed to develop a draft preferred scenario, which will ultimately become the basis of the MTP that we update. So that's a quick um, sort of timeline of how this is all going to go. Now, what I'd like to do now is walk you through um, this PowerPoint show, which is, for those of you who were at our MTP workshop, this is not nearly as long as that. Although I'm sure you all found it totally um, interesting, and I'm sure some of you came to more than one. Um, but what I, it's, it's really important to go through this because there are some fundamental concepts in here that we've developed that are um, kind of new, and they're a way to be looking at the region and thinking about all this integrated planning that we're talking about. So three scenarios, same amount of growth, same amount of money to be invested in the transportation system, um, but uh, just basically laying out on the land differently. And the way that we describe these scenarios is in terms of um, community types. Four types of communities to be exact. And these are not communities in the sense of, you know, thinking of a city, so like the city of Sacramento, Sacramento that we're in, or the city of Rancho Cordova down the highway, but um, types of places that have particular um, land use and transportation characteristics. And how those places grow over time can vary quite a bit, and then how they relate to each other and how you know people live in them and can get around um, depends on that. So this is a map of those community types, and I'd like to walk you through those to make sure that we understand all of them. And for some of you, hopefully this is kind of intuitive, and for those, some of you, maybe it's brand new, so we'll just see how it goes. Uh, the first of these is center and corridor communities, and these are um, on the regional map up on the screen in red. Um, the corridors are more linear, the centers are more circular, that's pretty intuitive, but these are areas that um, are unique in that they are they are centers of activity. So they range in size across the region from historic downtowns in our um, smaller cities of Winters and Live Oak and Placerville and Isleton, and they also um, are downtown Sacramento is also a center. And then we have a number of commercial corridors in the region um, that also fall into this category. And as I said, what distinguishes them is they have a high concentration of activity. Today, most of these places have a lot of jobs or a lot of um, commercial or shopping within them, so they're kind of higher density than the places around them. And in the scenarios, some of these places have um, more of that, 
and they also have varying degrees of more housing within them. So they are kind of concentrated areas of activity as far as land use goes. From a transportation perspective, they also will have probably the most transportation options of any of the other geographies around the region. Some of these areas are light rail stations, so they will have rail um, today or maybe in the future. Um, some of these places have really good bus service. Some of these places don't have any rail or bus service, but they are downtown and they have a really great walking and biking um, infrastructure because they've got just a good um, you know, set of streets and sidewalks and so forth. So these places, as I said, are gonna have the most kind of opportunity for that there, the most supportive um, infrastructure for lots of different ways of traveling. Then we have established communities, which are in gray on the map here. Those represent really all of the ex existing communities in our um, urban areas today. And the main thing that distinguishes, distinguishes established communities is that they're not gonna change a lot in their character in the future. Um, they're pretty much uh, gonna stay the way they are. So residential communities will be residential, the employment um, you know, centers will be employment, and they'll, they'll you know, maybe get some infill development here and there, but they're not gonna change a lot. From a transportation perspective, there's a wide variation among them. Um, some of them have great bus service, some of them don't, both now and in the future. Some of them uh, have sidewalks and some of them don't and may never can have sidewalks, but they generally aren't gonna change in their character much. And then a third community uh, type of developing community in blue on the map here. These are communities that um, are under construction today, so they haven't really matured fully, or they, are, they don't even exist today, so they will be um, developing at some point in the future. And they tend to be the next, um, you know, the next area of development outside of the um, existing urban area. And most of these tend to be residential in character. They have some um, commercial serving. Some of them have some new employment centers in them as well, but they generally are a continued extension of established communities. And then the last of the community types we have are the rural residential communities. Um, these are, well, they're rural, and they're on the outside of the urban area, obviously, um, primarily large lots on acreage. And so this is an area where obviously getting around is really um, almost entirely by car. So we presented these, um, these community types to everybody and then talk, talked about in the workshops how um, the three scenarios are different based on the amount of growth that is occurring in these three different types of communities. So given that I've just run through these different communities for you, I'm gonna show you one of the ways we talked about how the land use varies within those scenarios and see if you follow along with me. So, this bar chart represents the three scenarios and the new homes in each of the scenarios. So you'll see that they're all the same size, about, they represent about 300,000 new jobs, but um, red for center new corridors and then gray, blue, and um, yellow for the other community types. What you see is the distribution of, of those homes within those types. So you can see that um, from scenario one to two to three, you have an increasing share of new uh, new housing in the centers and corridors, and then correspondingly, the other three community types see a sort of a smaller um, progression from scenario one to two to three. So there is some significant difference there, but when you look at that growth laid on top of what's already in the ground today, which is what this uh, graph is representing here, there's not a lot of change in sort of the general distribution of development. So year 2008, we'll just call that today for simplicity, um, is showing what the distribution of, um, of housing is in the region right now, and then you can see how that changes from scenario one, two, and three. So you can see that you know, there's some dramatic changes in terms of what, where the new growth is going, but really it's not on top of what's already in ground state. It's a big difference. So as I said, kind of going back to that, this is sort of a refinement type of scenario, uh, refinement type of exercise. Okay, so that is a snapshot of what we've done with the land use part of the scenarios. And now what I'm gonna show you is a table that talks about um, where the funding for transportation goes within these scenarios. So we're trying to pair, well, you know, the right types of transportation to support um, the type of land use that's been um, put into these scenarios. So along the left, you see um, different categories of transportation funding, and then you see how much is spent in billions of dollars across the three scenarios. So taking transit as an, as an example, you can see it's going from about $11 billion in scenario one to um, just under $14 billion in scenario three. And while that's not a big difference, it can, you know, percentage-wise, it might not be a huge dramatic difference, but it does have an impact on um, how that uh, scenario performs, which I'll get to very soon. 
And then you go on down the line, generally what you'll see is that when you go from scenario one to two to three, you see an increase in the amount of transit um, funding that's in the scenarios, and you also see an increase in the amount of money spent on um, pedestrian and transit infrastructure, as well as roads that support that. So kind of more, um, uh, it gets more multimodal, if you will. Um, you also see an increase in um, the amount of money spent on programs. An example of programs are, or uh, a couple of them are clean air programs, uh, ride share programs, as well as uh, some of our other grant programs like community design. Um, somebody asked the question of what other incentives are there for transit priority areas. This is a potential one that already existed um, from our last, actually from two NTPs ago, which is a grant program that's used to um, incentivize smart growth development, um, and it pays for, uh, it's a competitive process, and it pays for the transportation or infrastructure component of the project. So that's the type of funding that gets increased when you go from scenario one to two to three. And then what you also see is that um, road capacity, the amount of money that's spent on that goes down from scenario one to two to three. So you kind of see this inverse relationship between them. And why is that? Well, that's where we get to outcomes. So, so um, we'll be talking about what the performance is here. Uh, for the workshops, we, helped, we had um, presented 15 different metrics, and then we had a big, basically, appendix of more metrics for people to look at. We have a lot of those. What I'd like to focus on today are some of um, the ones that are probably going to be a more focus for the transit priority area aspects of this grant program. And so, ultimately, what we had between the three scenarios is um, shifting really of about 25 to 30 percent of both the growth and the transportation investment. So again, it's not, these three scenarios are not dramatically different than each other. They're sort of refinements, but you see that shifting around produces some interesting um, and distinctive results there. So when we get to outcomes, and we're talking about the fact that we have an increasing amount of investment in centers and corridors, where you have um, you know, higher density of development, so you need you need to and want to be able to support that with a lot more transit, walking, and biking. Well, you also have less development happening outside of those areas, relatively speaking. And so that's why you see that you have less investment in the road capacity. So that's just the relationship. I want to make sure that we're all understanding there. OK, so I'm going to go through some of these outcomes. Um, and and when, I want you to think about those, because I know you'll also be thinking about performance measures in the next presentation coming up. So think about how these all will be relating to each other and how we can be improving upon them, improving upon how we communicate them, um, and so on. So this first one is it's called the Share of New Homes Near High Frequency Transit. Um, as we talked about, high frequency transit uh, is defined as um, transit that is running every 15 minutes <coughs> during rush hour traffic. That's, the, that's actually a definition in uh, Senate Bill 375, and so we went ahead and used that because that's ultimately where the transit priority area definition will come from. So what you see on this screen is uh, scenarios one, two, and three. There are 126,000 homes in the ground today that have that kind of transit service. In those scenarios, we add a, from a range of 60 to 130,000 new homes to, uh, to places where they end up getting um, high, uh, high quality transit. Those homes going into the ground then make it possible for homes that are in the ground today to get access to that kind of transit. So the top number you see there are the number of homes from 73 up to 157,000 existing homes that end up getting higher quality transit because new homes came in and helped build the population base that would support more transit. Okay, if that didn't make any sense, let me try it again with road, or with jobs. And if that still didn't make any sense, somebody hurry up and write the question so we can get it on the card and have an answer at the end of it. Okay, so share new jobs near high, um, near high frequency transit. Same deal. There's a lot more jobs near high frequency transit today because that's how our transportation has been built to serve all the job centers. So obviously it's going to be about the same amount in all three scenarios. Uh, the second bar is showing you um, how many new jobs get high quality transit in each of the scenarios, so 92, about 160,000. And then, because those jobs and all the housing from the previous slides have been added into those existing areas, you get this many more existing jobs with access to high quality transit. So it's an interesting story that we found. You know, there's typically this pull um, and this tension between new growth coming into existing areas and, you know, it's de 
rating quality of life, but we're seeing that there are in some ways um, ways